Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they've built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons to get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I am thrilled that you're here. And I've got a great show for you today. Got a guy that I know is going to add tremendous value. His name's Mark Curry, and he's been in the business 17 years. You know, he's he's done a combined value of about a billion dollars in assets, buy, sell, um, and hold. He's in multiple asset classes, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. Mark, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks, Rod. Great to be here. Oh, thank you. So, listen, why don't you do a much better job of telling, uh, you know, high-level background on you to get a little better framework for who you are, um, you know, and, 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 you know, why real estate and, and then we'll take it from there, man. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I started out um, corporate America uh, doing a lot of financial analysis, um, budgets and planning spreadsheets, Rod, very fun stuff, um, but also started investing in the side uh, when I was 25. So how old am I? 42. So in 2005, I started investing in real estate very active investing back then, right? You buy, fix, renovate, rent, sell. Primarily uh, single family back then? A lot of single families, mm -hmm. small multifamily. Most of it, Rod, was 12 units or less. Um, almost everything we bought was distressed. Mm -hmm. Foreclosures, REOs, short sales, you know, boarded up, needed a ton of love. We did that for, uh, till about, for about five years. My family and I were partnering, my brothers, my parents, my, my aunts, nice. my cousins. Yep. And then by 2010, um, just I was just hooked, right, for, for life, really, Rod, and decided to open up our company. Uh, my father and I partnered. We created uh, SMK Capital Management. It's the name of our firm. That's mm -hmm. our initials. We focused at the time, Rod, we were really looking to just expand, to keep doing more. There was a lot of buys back then, as you probably remember. Oh, yeah. It was a great time. Yeah, yeah, we were buying. Course, I was, I was recovering back then. I was, I, I lost my butt in two thousand eight and nine. You may or may not know, but uh, I, I, if I hadn't been, you know, I'd, we'd be doing this in the back of my three hundred foot yacht because that was a fantastic <laughs> time to buy. Anyway, sorry. Okay. Please continue. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we saw a lot of opportunity at the time. Of course, mm -hmm. to you could buy properties that were like sixty percent off what they were just being right. sold a couple of years before. And so we did right. that for a number of years. We started raising capital from friends and from colleagues, you know, outside and expanded our network of capital. Um, and then we really wanted to diversify, Rod. You know, when I left corporate America, I had a, a 401k. It was kind of sitting idle. Once you become an entrepreneur, you can't match your own uh, contributions, et cetera. So I opened up a self-directed IRA. And the purpose of that was to, to diversify, spread my own investments, um, started investing as a limited partner into mobile home parks, into self-storage, into a few other asset classes and areas, um, all through referrals, through networking on the ground, shaking hands, meeting private groups that we found to be specialists in one thing mm -hmm. and uh, diversify our own capital that way. Mm -hmm. So we did that in simultaneous for, for a couple of years with our own deals. And then we decided to syndicate some, some investment opportunities, Rod, to our, our investor group to let them diversify. Um, and we continue to do that today. And so fast forward today, we really focus on a few different asset classes. Uh, we try and, and, and be very recession resistant whenever possible. Um, and we think we bring you know, financial acumen and also some operational experience to the table to help us uh, hopefully pick great deals. Yeah, yeah. Deal. So what asset classes are you in? Uh, I know you said mobile home parks. I, I, did you say self-storage as well? I don't recall. Yeah, exactly, Rod. So we, we over the years, my family and I, we've invested in probably over a dozen different asset classes, student housing, wow. senior living, vacant land, uh, short-term rentals. Um, but we focus today really on four um, uh, mm -hmm. apartments. Number one, um, sp specific types of apartments in certain regions, not all apartments, of course. We also love mobile home parks. Uh, we love self-storage. We also invest in uh, ATMs, the machines, cash oh. machines. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I know that uh, somewhere I saw a fly on the wall say that you like affordable housing. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, we do. You know, it's, um, gosh, it's, it's one of our favorite sectors, I would say, Rod, for several reasons. But uh, to summarize, we just think there's a long-term 
tailwind behind the asset class from a demand standpoint from residents and from uh, investor buyer groups. So what's your definition of affordable housing? Let's make sure we're on the same page. Perfect. So we look at it as housing that can be reasonably afforded by the local population. And there's a formula to it as well, where you look at area median income. Mm -hmm. And if somebody is earning 80% of area median income, they're considered um, affordable. It's, uh, excuse me, low income. And then very low income is 50% or below. And so it's housing that can be afforded by different areas of uh, area median income. That changes. So, so, so with that, with that, with that um, metric, uh, 50 yeah. to 80% of median income, what, what rental amount do you allow? Uh, I mean, how do you back into what someone can afford? You know, we use the yeah. three times, three times the rent rule um, for income. Do you do the same thing in the affordable space or do you do it differently? Same concept, right? Same, same. Okay. It, right? The rent to okay. income ratio, 30% rule, um, or let's say it's $1,000 a month for the, the apartment, you'll want the folks to be earning $40,000 a year in income. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so, um, so do you have C class assets then as well? Some. We, we okay. focus a lot on, um, I'd say, B that have value yeah. add. And we also have been investing in some nicer class A properties that have tax exemptions for same, affordable same. housing. Same here. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you, you know, sidebar, how do you feel about um, where we are economically and how it might impact that C-class demographic? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Is that why you shifted? I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, we, we are, uh, so to answer your question, I, I think the C-class asset uh, segment has of course, some of the lowest rents, which are the most affordable when compared to other apartments, right? So we like that concept. Um, we also, uh, we like to be able to, to grow value, Rod. I know you do the same. And yep, so if you come into a property that maybe it's a little bit older, it's got outdated interiors. If you buy it right, you can allocate capital and improve them. Um, I, I think there's also a little bit more, how should I say, they're a little bit more affected during uh, economic downturns than maybe a B class, so that's probably well, that, that. That's where I was going with it. You okay. know, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing inflation, which is, I mean, the price of eggs, for example, gas. I mean, it's it's insane, and and mm -hmm. Walmart even had something in the news uh, where their earnings are down, and they feel like you know their demographic is 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 really hurting, and and of course we see personal debt increasing as well. And so, you know, I'm on the, I'm in the camp that, you know, these, that, that C-class demographics getting their butts handed to them. And it's, it's sad. And, and, and it's a little dangerous for operators that are in that C, C minus space, even D space, uh, in my opinion, I could be wrong. I'm wrong all the time, but uh, um, I would be a little nervous about those assets through what we're heading into. I don't know if you disagree, agree. I, I think so. I mean, there's yeah. there's pros and cons to every asset class, Rod. Right. As you know, I think in the right. C class specifically, you're going to see um, through tougher times, uh, higher vacancy, higher bad yeah. debt, people having a right. tougher time paying their rent, and right. so you have to work with a team that's really good and right. so very much focused on that demographic, and they know how to handle situations early on and are very proactive versus reactive to changes in the market. Yep. You said it. You said it right there. And I'll absolutely agree. So, you know, um, uh, I've got some some topics here that uh, uh, were bantered about. Um, one of them is uh, discussing strategies to recession resistant your portfolio to make it less volatile in, in really, in we're heading into a recession. I think it's a given. Uh, and so if we're not there already, uh, technically, I believe we're there already. I think they changed the, changed the rules to make it so that we're not, but I believe we are already. So, you know, how, how do you create a recession resistant portfolio? So uh, first I'd start by defining what that even means, right? It's, okay. it's somewhat you loosely, loosely used. So to us, it means a portfolio that can withstand market volatility, that can continue to do well in uh, a recession or, or economic tough times. And do well means to us, uh, it stays in high demand from users and from and other investor groups, uh, which is who we sell to. So we're looking at our exit. And it also 
um, will maintain its value or potentially even keep growing. So if it's inversely correlated, the demand for it will go up during a tough time. And so that's how we define it. Um, that's that's kind of some of the fundamentals. We're, we're, we love cash flow, Rod. So if it can keep pumping out cash flow and provide distributions and we can wait through a recession and not be forced to sell, those are some other thoughts during the recession resistant mindset for us and, and how we like to invest. So it's it's basically just you know how you go into an asset you've got all, you know you you take that very conservative approach as as do we to you know uh, uh, to basically create a situation that you just described. Now, have you purchased the last couple of years? Have you been buying assets the last couple of years? Yeah, we we've been investing and in, and in the way we we invest, Rod, is we partner with other operating partners and we okay. raise capital from ourselves and from our investor group and invest, and then we're right. all part owners in the asset that's being purchased. Right. Uh, the answer is yes. We we did stop for seven months. We made no new investments during COVID mm. on purpose. Uh, you know, early 2020, we just stopped everything. We were in the middle yeah. of a deal actually, Rod, and we told our investors, nope, we're not moving forward. Here's your money back. And, you you uh, thought it was the catalyst that I thought it was. It never, it didn't end up to be, but but it, you know, we thought it was uh, for sure. Uh, okay, okay, fair we enough. We didn't know, you know, when we right, don't no, know, we right. yeah. Be, so. be conservative. I felt the same way. I, I, in fact, I did a YouTube video, the coming real estate crash of whatever that year was, twenty. Yeah. And of course, I <laughs> yeah. got a lot of hate, but it was the most watched video I've ever had. Oh, like, some people it. love negative news, but um, yeah. um, so let me ask you this: Have you utilized what sort of debt have you utilized? Any bridge debt uh, has been all conforming? Yeah, good question. So um, it's transitioned on purpose for us. And so right. in 2020, after waiting several, seven months or so to watch to see what was going on, right. we saw a ton of tailwinds in the market, Rod. I mean, rent growth was going astronomically oh, high. I was 30% in some markets, annual, Nuts. crazy. Exactly. Yeah. And so there was an investment strategy that we added to our portfolio, which was um, to come in and, and essentially renovate some older properties called 8090 vintage apartments, specifically in growth markets, and to sell them within two to five years. And so okay. somewhat more short term compared to what we typically invest in. Uh, those properties all had bridge debt and uh, cat interest rate caps. Um, mm -hmm. Then in 2022, in February, January, February, we stopped doing those investments mm. uh, because the capital markets adjusted significantly. And so right. since then, we've just been focusing back on recession resistance, long-term kind of fixed rate debt, a lot of agency debt today, Rod, and that's where our, our focus is. Have you sold out of those properties that, uh, that you were describing that you did the quick turns on? Do you still have some of them? Where are you at with that? Yeah, we sold the first one. Um, just a giant home run on that one, Rod. It was, uh, I mean, we got, we got our investors a really attractive return, like over gotcha, 90%. Gotcha. But uh, we still carry a few others. We're still renting we some units and, and across right. those portfolios, but we have some that are slated to hopefully sell this year. We'll see, depending on the markets and, and into next year. Well, I, I can tell you, the reason I ask is I've got a couple of bridge loans with a former partner and and he's sweating it because they're asking for a two million dollar reserve on one of them. And you know we've got an operator in in uh, San Antonio. We're looking at an asset, and his reserve payment to his bridge lender went from eight thousand to eighty thousand a month. Wow. Um, you know, so so you know that bridge debt is onerous debt. And you know, with what's happened with cap rates, and well, cap rates not as much yet, but is happening now. Uh, but definitely with interest rates, it's made it very very challenging. To exit some of those deals, and in fact, I'm, I was in uh, I was at an event in Vegas last week, and uh, I met with a, a really competent operator, uh, just a rock star. Uh, the operator, very impressive guy that I've always looked up to, frankly, because he just runs a really tight ship. And he was freaking out because he's got ten deals with bridge debt, and he's just very concerned about exit strategy on those deals. And that's why I asked the question because, you know, I think. As we move into this recession, the, if it's not as big as I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be pretty bad. But if it's not that bad, at the very least, I think some of these unseasoned, unskilled operators that have bridge are going to be are going to have some heartburn and going to have some issues. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, I would agree. There's also a lot of <clears throat> what we call rescue capital route out there. Oh, that right. Ready waiting to, to pounce, waiting to That's pounce. Right. I, I'm, yeah. I'm in that. I'm in that bucket as well. Uh, so, so you know, we're gearing up for that as well. And 
Um, you know, we'll see how it goes, but we're already seeing, you know, I can tell you in the last six months, I've gotten more contacts from brokers than I've gotten in the last four years. And I'm sure you've seen the same thing. Sure. You know, I mean, things have slowed down and there's there's more and more opportunity. But t- let's talk about what you're doing on, on a deal analysis, underwriting, um, you know, how that shifted in this current environment. Uh, you know, sure. Uh, I'm sure you're much more conservative. What does that look like uh, at, at a more micro level? Yeah. So, I mean, we've been underwriting, for example, to get technical exit cap rate growth for many years on everything right, we do. Of course. Rod. Same. Keep doing that today. I think that's a big, just a kind of a quick step. If you're looking at a deal, check that out. Right. And so sure. um, uh, we also, we, we are, we're underwriting what we think is realistic rent growth. And we also will stress test it now, assuming there's no rent growth. How does which the is, which is possible. I, yeah. I, just, I just, I'm sorry. Sorry. I just dropped something. I did, which is possible. I just saw um, a co-star report uh, uh, where a guy, a CCIM did an analysis of a market that we have an asset in and uh, the rents have declined. Uh, and this is a super high growth um, market. Uh, um, but uh, you know, so, so, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I we'll mean, see what happens. We'll yeah. see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so you're doing that. Um, I'm sure you're looking at uh, break-even analysis, and you're looking at, um, you know, uh, if if your liquidation event is a is a refinance, you're 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 plugging that in and and being conservative with the interest rates and so on and so forth. At that point, yeah. Yeah, same, we, same, we same won't point. always put the 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 refi in the underwriting. Often no. won't. No, 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 no. Because it boosts the, it boosts the returns. A lot of a lot of operators yeah. will throw a you know a refi in there just to make the returns look better. Yeah, no, that's. I'm glad you brought yeah. that up. And by the way, guys, if you're investing, if you're investing passively, um, and uh, and and someone presents a deal to you now with a three or four year refi, just recognize the fact they're likely have that in there to boost the returns. Uh, and so keep that in mind. Yeah. So, uh, well, we, we t- kind of talked about the current investment environment and how we're reducing risk. I'm doing the same thing you're doing in that regard and stress testing and so on and so forth. You know, um, uh, you know, Tell me, let, let's let's shift gears a little bit. In this career of yours, which is very varied and, and you've done lots of different things, talk about some of your epiphanies, like aha moments that you had and and as it relates to this business. Okay. Um, I think, you know, going back to different points in my career when I've pivoted and maybe gone left when I didn't expect to initially, Mm-hmm. Those those come to mind a little bit, Rod. And um, I, I'll, I'll tell you, for example, we stopped investing in single family homes as investments for flips and for rentals uh, about five, six years ago. Mm. Why'd we do that? That was an aha moment, as you asked, because we just started seeing that the potential for um, the same return that we were essentially working hard for in single family could also be achieved in other asset classes and a at little bit scale bit. too, right? At, at scale. scale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the big one for us was, you know, looking at operating expense ratios. And so the single family home, I mean, depending on where it is, Rod, the operating, I mean, there's not a lot of margin there. No, there, there's not much cash flow in single family homes, guys. I've had 2000 <laughs> ask me how I know. Okay. Yeah. Long-term <laughs> rentals. Uh, no. And people don't believe you when you say that. Oh, well, it's rented for 200 more a month than I'm collecting. Yeah. Well, wait till you have a turnover and it costs you 3000 or more to turn it over and you're empty for two months. And then tell me about your cash flow for the two year period. Right. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I learned that the hard way. Most of my assets were C class. So, you know, they've got uh, a, a tougher demographic. They're older, tons of maintenance. The maintenance just kills you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So that was an epiphany. Yeah. Okay. I'm on the same page. I mean, we've invested in homes that are over 100 years old right, out in the Midwest. Right. Same here. Same here. You just yeah. you, what you think the CapEx and the budget for repairs is, you know, you, you might be right. You might be way off. And so a lot more, uh, uh, I would say, volatility in, in the cash flow stream. Yeah. Um, and then when you compare it to like a large apartment community and we're investing in stuff that's five, 600 units. Yeah. 
I mean, to think about what would have to happen for 20 to 30% of those people to leave all around the same time and for nobody else to move in. Right. It's so unlikely, right? right. It would have to be a devastating event that would affect the entire region, you know, storm, right. something like that. Right. Right? So right. you're just a little bit more protected there. You got operating expense ratios that are a lot more uh, favorable from a margin standpoint. So I think that was a big aha moment for us when we we're just investing in both and we decided to focus just on larger, more institutional quality assets. Yeah, it took a kick in my butt for me to get that memo, <laughs> but uh, I, I lost a lot of money in 08 and 09, and 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 that was my that was my uh, memo on that. But uh, so let me ask you this: your team, obviously, this business is a team sport. Uh, just describe who's who's on your team. How many you know in inner inner circle? I'm not talking about on site staff or stuff like that. Sure. But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've evolved, like I said, Rod, right over the last 15 years, we uh, essentially are a private equity firm today. And so we partner with other groups, other teams, other operators that handle all the day-to-day operations. Most of them have an acquisitions team. They have an asset management team. They have a property management team. Okay. Uh, And so that's where a lot of the day-to-day gets done at the asset level. I gotcha, gotcha. Totally for us, it's... it's, uh, you know, more of an investment management firm. So CPA, bookkeeper, portfolio manager, uh, myself, and some other uh, uh, fund managers that we partner with. And, and well, work well that, 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 that's, I'm really glad. I, I guess I didn't pick up on the fact that you're primarily private equity at this point, but that brings up a couple of great questions. What do you look for in an operator Gosh, when, yeah. you're, when you're looking to place you know, your yeah. hard-earned money or money you've raised uh, that people are relying on you for? What do you look for in an operator to work with? Yeah, so um, that's been a, a long evolution for us because we've worked with a lot of operators. We've actually underwritten, vetted more than 120 over the years, Rod, um, wow. across multiple asset classes because we invest in different things. And multiple regions and geograph- geography, I'm sure. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Right. So we're, first and foremost, we're looking for something special. Like, what do you do that makes you so unique? Mm. Um, do they Are they in a certain niche that they're one of the best or the best at? Mm-hmm where you would rather partner with them than try and learn it yourself. So yep. Smart. That's, that's an initial thought process of how do we get into certain um, uh, sectors that we otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't even go in ourselves. And so partnering with folks that are specialists in one thing is, is a good start. We look at track record, pedigree, experience. Um, hopefully they're, you know, they've been in it longer than us uh, and they've, they've seen different market cycles, different trends. Mm-hmm. Um, you're also looking for, a lot, a lot of times, it's not like a hard line in the sand for us, but vertically integrated rod where they have. I was going to ask that question. So you, 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 and what he means, guys, is is a is an operator that has their own property management company. They're managing themselves. Maybe has their own construction arm that handles their repositions. That's what he means by vertically integrated. I, I, I was that was going to be a question next. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, just really trying to ask yourself the question am I going to be really excited to keep working with these folks for the next 10 years, right? Not just one deal and try and build a relationship there. And so that's a big part of it for us is is the right people. Um, And then we look at, of course, uh, you know, from an underwriting standpoint, but the deal, and then how do they structure their deal Mm -hmm. heavily weighted in fees or do we find it to be more market rate and fair or that kind of thing. So uh, that's probably a good start. No, that that sounds good. Now, um, you know, it, do you have like an, uh, a, a, f- a financial range that you'll typically go into a deal for? Is it different by asset class or or what does that look like? You know, what 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 sort of, you know, yeah. do you like to invest? Um, Five million, 10 million, two million? You know, what, what do you typically do? Most of our investments we're raising and in, in investing between two and five million per deal. Gotcha. Okay, so yeah. so moderate, moderate. Okay. Yep. Um, and um, okay, and do you exert control in your deals when you go in? And, and this is for my own edification, honestly. Uh, not not that I'm looking to do business with you, but I'm just curious because uh, a lot of private equity does in- exert some control. Can you speak to that a little bit? It depends, right? And so I'll start by saying um, we're partnering with an operating partner because we want them to handle the day-to-day operations and be in control. That's the purpose, right? We we believe they do it very well. Um, With that, sometimes we will get consent rights where we have to have a vote for certain exit strategies, a sale, a refi, et cetera. Um, And a lot of it for us, Rod, is more just how transparent are they? How well do they communicate? Are we on monthly calls? 
looking at the asset and going through the financials and the business plan and talking to the asset manager, the property manager, or do we only are they only going to reach out to us, you know, four times a year with a, a PDF update that's two pages long? And that gotcha. that's a big part too, is is how how much attention can they provide us to feel really comfortable about them, their team? Uh, and it takes time, right, Rod? So a lot of times we'll we'll start with a personal investment. Uh, start small, work with them, see how it goes, get a little more comfortable, learn more, and then maybe go from there and, and offer smart. something to our investors. So smart, smart, smart. Fun. So as we get into this recession, um, are there any asset classes you won't consider? Yeah, there's a, f- a bunch, actually. <laughs> um, Talk to me. Talk to me. I think the first few that come to mind right now are office. Office, for sure. Good Lord. Malls. Um, yeah. yeah. Malls, right? Malls. Short-term yeah. rentals. We, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. some retail we may do, but most retail we won't do. Uh, yeah. Same here. Student housing, senior housing. Uh, See, you wouldn't do senior. Now, senior, I, I feel pretty good about. Student you know, if you listen to Harry Dent, who's a doom and gloomer, but he's an economist yeah. that he talks about population demographics. And I tell you, it, it's a little sobering for the student housing sector uh, as it relates to student age, you know, uh, demographics. But senior living now, that's a different story. Why, 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 what's your hesitation there? Gosh, it goes back to the same kind of thought process on why we don't really do single family homes. Uh, they're really expensive to operate. And so- yeah. You have a staff. And litigious. <laughs> and litigious. Nobody wants to see grandma be left outside or hurt or whatever. And oh, you're, right. you're, yeah, very litigious as well. Okay. Just just a tight, tight margin business and a lot of overhead. And so, uh, and we find that the returns aren't any necessarily better than other no stuff. Kidding. No so kidding. Why, why I did not know that. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I, I thought that they had pretty decent margins, but I, I know that they're they're dying finding help, you know, exactly. and paying help you know, to, to get competent help. They did, they underpay. And, and so, yeah. Okay. Now that's. Very and this is all general, Rod, right? Don't oh, no, no, no. I know there, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah. it, it changes in different markets and everything exactly. else. Yeah. Oh, so let me ask you a question. I, I just asked somebody else on the show here. Um, uh, we started doing interviews uh, live in person. It's a shame we couldn't do that. It's a lot of fun. It's for, yeah. did our first did our first one here at my studio, but uh, I asked him, you know, if you went back and told 18 year old Mark, you know, told him what you know now. Is there anything you might do differently in this business? Would you, I mean, would you have even screwed with single family? I think I would have, and I'm probably going to have my kids do the same, Rod. I think it's yeah. really great to learn from. And yeah. so okay. I would have started at 18 and not okay. later. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's number one. Yeah. Um, I probably would have also partnered with more people that were much more experienced earlier on. And so those are, you know, I think, two of the biggest. No, those are those are big ones it's to prevent the seminars. I don't call them failures; I call them seminars. You know, to prevent the prevent the seminars or make them smaller sure. seminars, as it were. There yeah. You go. So, what's some of the best advice you've ever received? And it can be in any, and it can be personal, business, relationship, whatever. What's some of the best advice you've ever received? Uh, yeah. So it, it's something we try and do all the time. Number one is is be patient mm-hmm. and say no a lot. Mm. And yeah. so uh, it's hard to do when you're, especially yeah. if you're young and you're new, you want to, you want to invest, you want to grow. It's like inside of you and you just feel it and it's burning in you, but you can also make mistakes that can take years off of your career. And so right. be patient, go slow and say no a lot. I like it. I like it. Especially in the time that we're in right now, for sure. Um you know, uh, is there a book that you gift more than another to people? I'm sure you have people asking you, hey, can I pick your brain for an hour? They think they're going to learn a business in an hour or whatever. But, uh, you know, is there a book that you gift more than others? Can be any genre. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the first one that everyone knows about, or maybe they don't. Rich Dad, right. Exactly. Rich right. Dad. That that was a big one for me when I was young and early starting out. Um and then there's, uh, I mean, it depends how technical you want to get, but yeah. there's, uh, I, like, I'll just think of one that just, I just read, which was uh, Stephen Schwartzman's book, uh, What It Takes. I think it's, uh, he's the founder of Blackstone. And so oh, wow. um, it's his personal journey going back to his high school, college years, upbringing, and 
some of the uh, achievements. Was it good? Was it good? It was good. Yeah. Yeah. I thought maybe it would just be a giant pat on the back the whole time, but mm. uh, it was actually very compelling. You know, you could kind of just see that this individual has achieved so much, but he also has this, this character and this personality to get him where he is. Right. It's, it's interesting. Uh, a, he doesn't quit. Uh, he's very smart. He's liked by most. And he's he's done some amazing things throughout. Oh, his I mean, I, they're they're worth more than most countries. So you know, it's 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 insane how how profitable and successful they are. So you know, where do you get your drive, Mark? What what's the why? What's 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 the what's what gets you to jump out of bed every morning? Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure. Rod, right? Really, really. I think, you know, he, here's what it is for me. I, I've just had this inherent. Um, it's part of my character, I guess, to always be improving mm, uh, good. anything I'm doing. And I start out usually in most any new feed as an observer. And I take a ton of notes and I, I'm a sponge rod for something that I'm interested in. And so I think that's possibly part of my analyst background and um, uh, growing up, enjoying math and uh, also uh, listening and, and being really an observer. And then you keep doing that over a long period of time, you wake up in the morning and, you know, it's almost like, gosh, what, what am I going to learn today? And it's, it's exciting to have that thought process. And so nice. um, I don't know if there's any, necessarily one thing that's my drive. It, it's, uh, it's, it's all of that. And kind of just over decades of wanting to always be improving. Nice. No, that's awesome. You know, I'm a Tony Robbins mentee and uh, he has this term called can I, it's constant and never ending improvement. Uh, you know, even these little, these little improvements you make, you take them out two years, three years, five years, 10 years, they're massive, massive shifts. So, you know, it. I have, I have a lot of aspiring investors that listen to the show, people that know they need to do something. They, they, they hear about success stories. And, you know, I do, I do episodes now called multifamily rock stars, where I just interview my students. And I, I mean, I've got a backlog. I've got so many that are successful now. And, you know, but the ones that haven't taken action yet, what words of wisdom might you share with an aspiring multifamily investor or real estate in general? It doesn't have to be multifamily specific. Sure. Um, I, I would say, you know, you got to rip the Band-Aid off, right? And, oh. and you got to go for it. Um, I, I had trouble doing that early on too, right? With a W-2, it's hard to leave. Yeah. Safety. You it's comfortable. Comfort. It's comfortable. Comfort zone's a nice warm place and nothing freaking grows there, right? So I know. <laughs> That's yeah. good. I like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, take the Band-Aid off. And if you're, again, if a student of Rod's, I mean, you're in great company. So oh, thank you. Thank you for the time that. to do it. You got, you got a lot of support. So yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, that's not, I was not looking for that, but thank you for that. But oh, you're right. Yeah. You just, you just got to do it. You just got to do it. Like Nike says, right. But uh, well, listen, brother, I, I, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, you know, uh, we didn't make it to NMHC this year, but uh, probably will next year. We we've got a lot of stuff going on, but uh, hopefully we'll get to meet one of these, you know, mid market things or whatever and shake hands. And I look you know, forward if, if to you it, see uh, me and my eyes are crossed, please come up and smack me and, <laughs> and, and remind me that, that uh, who you are, but uh, I, I really yeah. appreciate you coming on and, and, and sharing your wisdom, my friend. My pleasure, Rod. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care now. You too. So one other quick thing. We encounter so many people that are frankly frustrated. You know, they're looking in the mirror and they're frustrated that they haven't been able to escape the rat race. They haven't been able to build cash flow to the point where they're able to have financial and time freedom with their families. You know, and maybe they see other people buying real estate and creating, you know, incredible cash flow. And they think, well, it's just scary. You know, buying apartments is intimidating. And I get it. But see, that's why we created our Warrior Mentorship Program. They're our coaching students and they've had extraordinary results. My students, I've been teaching about five years and they own upwards of 140,000 units now that we know of, right? And we feel like it's just getting going. Now we're looking to grow this group and really take it to the next level. And honestly believe that the greatest transfer of wealth could be upon us right now with this current economic environment. Everything's going on sale. So we're looking for people who wanna follow a proven framework, really like a blueprint or a map, literally step by step. And then they're able to leverage our systems and our incredible network to raise money and equity, to find deals and close those deals and build partnerships really nationwide. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more, 
in our incredible network and take advantage of the unbelievable opportunities that are upon us, you can apply to my Warrior Mentorship Program by texting the word CRUSH to 72345. Or you can go to mentorwithrod.com. And what we'll do is we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out and see if it's a fit. Now, again, you can go to mentorwithrod.com or text the word CRUSH to 72345 to apply, and we will speak soon.